Mark 14. There's a lot of passage. Today's message is probably one of my shortest for the last, at least the last since lockdown. Um, so even though the passage was long, the message is actually short. <laughs> it's the same by the alley. All right. Today in Mark chapter 14. The rubber is hitting the road and the poop is hitting the fan. Yes, it is going to be messy and it's serious. And what's happening? It's happening because God is asserting his power and his control over his creation. A power and control that was temporarily delegated to the the politicians of the day, the chief priests and the Pharisees and Sadducees and all that. It was temporarily delegated to the disciples, including Peter and Judas. And then we see each of these groups trying to hold on to this power and this control that was never theirs. In doing so, they find themselves justifying terrible things. Three things, three justifications that we see behind the actions of each group in our passage today. The first one is for the good of others, for the good of others. Some, they justify their actions for the good of others. Or to use the narrative, the rhetoric that we are very used to, they justify what they do because it will save lives. The second thing they do is they justify for the good of themselves. For the good of themselves. Some, they justify their actions to serve themselves, to make themselves wealthy, to bring upon themselves what they think will be power and security. And the third thing we see is people justifying actions for the good of a movement. Believe their movement's more important than even the will of God. But guess what? Each of these justifications will fail. Each will fail spectacularly. It'll be a big time failure. In fact, each of them, their justifications, their disobedience towards God, it will end in tears. Well, I'm going to pray. I'm going to have a look at those three things. I'm going to close talking about what it means to be, to actually be justified, not to justify. <laughs> All right, let me pray. Lord, thank you so much for your great love. Just come upon us by your Holy Spirit. Unpack your word for us and encourage us to follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, here we are. Three things that end in tears. Justifying actions for the good of others. Stick with me. I know that's, that's going to be a bit odd um, because that's, you know, that seems sacrificial, doesn't it? Justifying actions for the good of self, that's a pretty obvious one. And justifying actions for the good of a movement. Let's have a look at the first one. Justifying for the good of others. And this, this is how the chief priests and the teachers of the law, the politicians of their day, this is how they justify the choices they make and the atrocities they commit. They're doing it for the good of others. They're saving lives. Have a look at verse 1. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law, they were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. Now don't be alarmed. Don't be concerned. Killing Jesus is perfectly okay. It's justified. It's the right thing to do. This they must do for the good of everyone. For Jesus' message, it is poison. It's misleading people. It's making them lawbreakers. And this is, this is why they attack him so viciously, particularly on the Sabbath. Now, of course, they had corrupted the scriptures to come to this perspective, to this view, to this conclusion. But it's their view nonetheless. And from their perspective, trapping Jesus, lying about Jesus, it's completely justified if it saves a nation from the wrath of God. Yes, this means they were controlling the people with fear. A fear that they were exaggerating and encouraging. A fear that was based on a a small amount of truth. A fear that they could only maintain if they could keep God's prophets silent and prevent the truth from getting out. (laughs) Doesn't that sound just a, a little bit familiar? Don't get me started. My point's this. Instead of giving over control to the one who is really in control, instead of seeking to do his will, they try to keep it for themselves. And this is a path that can only end in tears. But not just their tears. It'll be the tears of Jesus' mother as she watches her, her son crucified on that cross. 
And it'll be the tears of countless generations as we read what they did here to Jesus in the name of saving lives. Of course, the great reversal, the great irony, is that Jesus' death does save lives. It saves everyone who chooses to follow him. Not something they believed, though. Okay, justifying actions for the good of others is going to end in tears, just like justifying actions for the good of self. This one's obvious, but I I think we can learn something from it. I certainly did. Um, So let's have a look at verse 4. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wage and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. You know the story? The woman came in, poured oil on Jesus and uh, anointed him. And they rebuked her harshly for her trouble. Now we know from the other Gospels that this rebuke, it was instigated and flamed by Judas. But still the others, they, they got on board. And it's their actions that I think we can learn from. And what we learned, at least what I learned, is this. Selfish motives can be difficult to spot as they tend to be hidden behind actions that claim to be for the good of others. <laughs> and in this case, it's for the good of Paul. But that doesn't help us spot him, does it? Why? Because we are to do things for the good of others. We are to love our neighbors, as Jesus said. So what's the secret? How do we spot the Judases? Well, the dead giveaway is in their approach. It's the devil's playbook, if you will. They accuse, they attack. And they rebuke. And they do it without asking any honest questions. There's no curiosity or desire to understand the person or God's will in the situation. Now, let me just go on a quick tangent for a moment. Okay, so all right. stretch your legs out. Ready for this tangent? One of the Pharisees, right? He, he broke this rule. And it, it's not a good idea, right? When you kind of, when you lean into Jesus and you actually get into his teachings with an open mind and open heart, there's normally one thing that follows and it certainly followed for Nicodemus. He, he approached Jesus. He was one of the Pharisees, one of the teachers, one of the bad guys, right? And he approached Jesus with open and honest questions. And the result, he became a follower of Jesus. It's quite amazing. In fact, it's, it's this point. Those with selfish motives, they go into the situation with no intention of changing their minds. And you can spot it because there's no imagination. There's no curiosity. There's only accusations, rebuke and hate as they're driven by the desire to keep whatever that selfish thing is all for themselves. (laughs) But I digress. Let's have a look at verse 7 and see how Jesus responds to this unjustified attack. Leave her alone. I'm pretty sure it would have been a bit more serious than that. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. Fortunately, most listened when Jesus spoke and they accepted the reprimand. And I mean, that's that's a huge credit in itself, the fact that you can accept correction. I think (laughs) that's quite rare, more rare than I think we realize. But they accepted the reprimand. But sadly for Judas and many of our state leaders, yeah, sorry about that, not really. He was not willing to give up control so easily. And so he justifies taking matters into his own hands. He justifies a terrible action. Have a look at verse 10. Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, he went to the chief priest to betray Jesus. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Well, I'm sure it's an oversimplification to say that Judas was simply trying to serve himself. Yet this appears to be the case, does it not? It appears as if he realizes through this interaction with Jesus and the perfume and this woman that Jesus is not going to be who he wants him to be. He's not going to serve him in the way he wants to be served. Jesus is happy to waste this perfume and also happy to leave them. He says he is going to leave them as well. So what does Judas do? Well, he uses what is within his control, the good of himself, and he betrays Jesus. And his false justification, his rejection, his rejection of Jesus and desire for self, gratification, it will end in tears. 
For in Matthew's gospel, we read that Judas was seized with remorse. I love that language. He's just, just so bent up and screwed up inside for his mistake. He's seized with remorse. It's a bit like what we see with Peter and the rooster crows and he runs for the hills. Yet Peter, Peter, Peter doesn't run from Jesus. He runs from his hurt. And we know what happens to Judas. He hangs himself. So friends, the lives of all who reject Jesus will end in tears. It's not a threat. It's not a big stick. It is a reality of that choice. Justifying actions for the good of others, it will end in tears. Justifying actions for the good of self, that's going to end in tears too. And you guessed it, justifying actions for the good of a movement, that's going to end in tears. As Peter, he's our example. He enters the story by declaring his allegiance to Jesus and the movement. Read it with me. Verse 27. You will all fall away, Jesus told them. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Then he says this. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Notice that Peter seems to ignore that line. Ignore those words. And all he hears is this. Even if all I fall away, I will not, said Peter. All he heard was that the sheep will scatter. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered. Today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. Do you notice that Peter doesn't, he just ignores the serious, the life-changing, the hope in Jesus' words when he said, I have risen, I will risen. When I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And Jesus continues to go ahead of us into every situation, but instead he ignores it. And worse, he's kind of triggered, isn't he? He's triggered by the suggestion that he wouldn't support Jesus and the movement. And we all know what happens next. Peter tries to prove Jesus wrong by fighting at his arrest, cutting off the soldiers' ears. Although who can blame him? I mean, who can blame him for lashing out? I, I would probably do the same. He, he wanted to protect this movement that he believed in with all that he had. He'd given up everything to follow Jesus. He'd given up his livelihood. He'd left his family behind. Everything he had given up for this movement. But even if we forget that sacrifice, how many more people would have benefit, benefited if Jesus continued his ministry in the way he was going? The people who would have been healed, the people who would have learned about him. How many more gospels would we have of what Jesus did? It would just be amazing if this movement could continue the way it was. But we're getting to the point now because this, this, was, this was never the plan. This was never the plan. And Peter's efforts, it's going to end in tears, quite literally. See, the problem is this. Christianity was never supposed to be a movement. Christianity was never supposed to be a movement. Jesus didn't come. Jesus didn't come to be justified. He came to justify us. It's a big difference. He came to justify you. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says this, Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justification is clearly important if it brings us peace with God and Jesus the one who brings that to us. We do it through Jesus. But what does it really mean? Well, simply put, justification is the term, it's the religious term, the theological term that we give what Jesus did, the act, the act of removing the condemnation, the guilt, the shame, the penalty, the eternal cost of our sin. This is what the cross does for us. This is what it's all about. But there's more. At the same time, it declares us right with God, righteous. It puts an end to the battle between us and God. But we are at war with God until we surrender to him. Now, I know that these words have been destroyed by countless movies with bad guys justifying their terrible actions in order to 
Oh, in order to redeem people before some false idea or false God. <laughs> it's exactly what we see in the Avengers series. You know, Thanos wants to wipe out half of the universe's population. He wants to redeem them so the others can be saved. Oh. Yet there's one person in today's story, just one, who does something different. One person who does something beautiful. She steps outside of the conflict. She, she, she moves away from trying to justify this or that. And she just worships Jesus. All she does is worship him. Let's jump back to verse 3. Have a look at what she did. While Jesus was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster, alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Do you notice there's no thought? There's no process. There's no weighing it up. There's no justifying her actions to the others or even to herself. She simply worships Jesus with all that she has. Exactly what we see the widow do with the coin back in Mark chapter 12. Brothers, sisters, friends, the appropriate response to what Jesus has done, what he has done for you and for me, is to worship him. It's to worship him. But worship is the most beautiful thing we can do. It's the most wonderful thing we can do. For me, it's often the only, it may be the only time where I stop thinking about my own needs. Am I hungry? What am I going to do next? Who am I? What am I thinking about? What am I doing? It's perhaps the only time I stop thinking about my children's and my family's needs. And all I do is praise and worship God for who he is and what he has done. It's a time of building relationship with him. Just sitting in thanks of it all. It's not just singing. It can just be reading his word. It can be a million things. No wonder the scriptures say this in Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is our true and proper worship. I'm pretty sure that's what this woman did. And they go on to say, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, his pleasing and perfect will. Somehow, I don't ask me how because I don't know, the proper worship of God reveals the patterns of this world. Perhaps it's, perhaps it's because we've stopped trying so hard and focusing in on our needs and what we're doing and we're looking to God. And that the rest just, just comes into focus. Maybe that's what it is. And again, somehow, don't ask me how, right worship helps us know what God's good and pleasing will is. I don't know again, maybe when we stop thinking about ourselves and we focus on him and his glory and his goodness, then everything just comes into focus and we start to understand what he wants for us and for his creation. And lastly, as I wrap it up, I did say it was a short message this morning. Let's remember. The Christianity was never supposed to be a movement. It was never to be a movement that we justify. We don't have to argue for Christ. It is the truth. It is who he is. It is what it is. It is true. There's no need, no argument that needs to be had. This is a faith that justifies us, makes us right with God. It ends that war between us and God that we see right through creation. And of course, it brings us to that wonderful joy of eternal life. Well, how about we, we worship our great God together? How about we do that this morning? We confess our sins because that's worship too. Again, it's turning away from me, turning to God. We say sorry for what we've done wrong. We receive his forgiveness and we turn to him. And then I've got our next song, which is Jerusalem. Uh, it is very powerful. It's a song that just forever moves me as it kind of walks through the power of the cross and what Jesus did for us. Uh, the imagery in the, in the film clip is also is equally powerful. So please enjoy that and sing along. But first, let me pray and then we'll, we'll, we'll confess our sins. Lord, thank you for your great love. I pray you move in our hearts to worship and praise you with, with righteousness and bring us to the fullness of eternal life.